So this is, as always, I start with my super oversimplification of the immune system for the people in the room who aren't hardcore immunologists. And what, uh, and also it's the first talk we've had about helminths, so I don't think I probably need to tell this audience that helminths are an incredibly important uh, evolutionary force um, in mammalian history. Um, they infect about a third of the, of the world's population, human population, but m a lot more animals than that. Um, and one of the things that's very characteristic immunologically is that uh, helmets turn on the type 2 arm of our immune system, uh, which is extremely complex, characterized by TL2 cells. And I'll focus only on the sort of prototypic cytokines, well, IL-4, I'll briefly mention IL-13, that signal through the IL-4 receptor. Um, and type 2 immunity is counter-regulatory with type 1 immunity, uh, which involves the prototypical interferon gamma. I've also thrown in TL17 and IL-17, only because Ruslan Metsitov recently called that all type 1 immunity, and it made life a little simpler. It's a little more complicated than that. But it's very clear that this arm of the immune system is the army of the immune system uh, that is there to protect us against, uh, against microbial pathogens. And without this arm of the immune system, we will die. Uh, what the function of type 2 immunity is, 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 I would say, clearly to protect us against helminths as well as ectoparasites and all sorts of other things. But exactly what its function is is not always so clear, partly because it is such a complicated system. And my lab has been particularly interested in, um, in macrophages and the role that macrophages play in type 2 immunity. And we got interested in that because we, we found that they were functionally very distinct from macrophages um, that were activated via type 1 cytokines like interferon gamma. And we discovered, along with another, several other groups at the same time, just as a lot of sequencing technology was happening, and we began to look at the transcriptome of these macrophages, that they made very, very distinct uh, molecules, and they had a very distinct transcriptome from macrophages that are what are called classically activated macrophages that are involved in antimicrobial mechanisms, that at least in mice are characterized by the production of nitric oxide. And in what Simon Gordon coined this term alternatively activated macrophages, and I use that term, and I use it very specifically, I use it very specifically in the way that Simon Gordon defined it, and that is macrophages that have been activated via the IL-4 receptor, which recognizes both IL-4 and IL-13. And these molecules that we defined, like ryl alpha and YM1, which I'm only going to briefly mention, um, they're turned on very specifically by the IL-4 receptor. And this is just pictures of macrophages expressing YM1 and realm alpha in a wild-type animal or an IL-4 receptor deficient animal. Probably what characterizes classical versus alternative activation the best is the arginine metabolism pathway. And it characterizes it well because it also characterizes how type 1 and type 2 immunity are, are counter-regulatory, even, at the, even at, the, at the coal face, at the at vector cell level. So, um, Arginine gets taken up through transporters into all cells, including macrophages. And if you have uh, IL-4 around, you produce arginase, which converts um, arginine into polyamines and proline. And if you have interferon gamma around, you get NOS2 or INOS, which converts, um, con converts arginine, leads to the production of nitric oxide. And so cells actually have to compete uh, for the arginine. And this is uh, very important. And because of this, um, people began to associate uh, alternatively activated macrophages with wound repair because polyamines uh, are involved in, in repair as well as uh, proline being the building blocks of collagen. But we really didn't know and still don't fully know what realm alpha and YM1 did. But as our lab and other labs began defining these macrophages, it became very, um, well, they became heavily written about in the literature and people began to describe their functions. And the three things you'll find in reviews about alternatively activated macrophages is that they're involved in worm killing, that they're involved in wound repair, and that they're anti-inflammatory. I think I'll try and talk about all three of those things, but to me that wasn't really immediately obvious why that would be the case. Um, and indeed, we now know they are involved in worm killing, but that has actually not been easy. Uh, they, they, it's not obvious their roles in worm killing, and it seems to be different in every infection and different infection models. But we've begun to see that they are involved in worm killing. Uh, so has Rick's lab, so have Bill Gauze's labs. Many other labs are beginning to see the role of macrophages in worm killing, but it's not been an easy task. People said they were associated with wound repair, but that was mainly because of this arginine metabolism pathway. But when we began to look at the expression of these various IL-4 receptor-driven molecules, one of the things we noticed is that they were turning up in situations of injury alone, where there was no known type 2 driver that, uh, that these molecules seemed to be associated with injury. 
And IL-4, almost since the beginning, has always been described as an anti-inflammatory molecule, and I'll come back to the significance of that. But one of the questions, especially when we began to see that realm alpha and YM1 were being turned on in the context of injury, was asking, well, what is the relationship between wound worm killing and wound repair? Why do you have um, a, a, an arm of the immune system, a particular cell type that's involved in both these processes? And it wasn't really that difficult if one thought too hard. Uh, Helminth parasites do a lot of physical damage. Um, so these are, this is a hookworm parasite um, uh, that will suck um, uh, the gut wall. And this is actually a picture from Alex Lucas's lab um, showing a hookworm parasite biting into, into the gut wall. And is, as part of the hookworm life cycle, the parasite, uh, well, it comes in via walking on grass, comes in uh, through the skin, migrates through the blood, and, and goes into the lung, bursting through the lung, doing a lot of physical damage, causing hemorrhaging in the lung, matures in the lung, you then swallow it, uh, and it ends up in the intestine. And I'm a little embarrassed because I say this at lots of talks and there usually aren't so many vets in the room, but I, I'm, I am told reliably by veterinarians who have done, um, who have done autopsies on sheep, which is uh, hookworm infections are extremely common in sheep, that, um, that the gut wall is covered with, with little scar tissue and that these parasites bite the gut wall every two to three minutes. And so the argument that we've been developing over the years is that if you don't immediately repair the damage that these worms do, you'll die of sepsis. And so that the hypothesis that, that we've started to work with is that Th2 mediated responses are response to injury. That yes, they're there in order to control parasite numbers, there's no question about that, but just as importantly perhaps they're there to, to make sure that, that the damage that those worms do, do is rapidly repaired. And that there's a cost to that, that uh, because you need to repair rapidly, you leave scar tissue, which might be one of the reasons type 2 immunity is very strongly associated with fibrosis. So, you know, it's a, it's a nice idea, but what's the evidence for it? And that's obviously, you know, it's obviously difficult to, to sort of prove evolutionary theory, but there is growing evidence, and one of the best papers came from Bill Gauze's lab a couple of years ago, and what he showed is that alternatively activated macrophages are needed to repair that damage that hookworms do when they migrate through the lung, and that without um, macrophages secreting a lot of these IL-4-dependent products, that the lung uh, fails to repair properly. And so I've been putting this, once again, being in a department that has a lot of evolutionary biologists around in terms of thinking what this means evolutionarily. And I think that basically any organism, not just mammals, any multicellular organism faces two fundamental types of challenge. One is microbial challenge. So something comes into your body and it's going to destroy you simply by sheer numbers, by replication. And that's what we've heard a lot about those kinds of pathogens today. And you absolutely need type 1 immunity. Without it, uh, you can't control those infections. And that, that kind of, and type 1, including both innate and adaptive forms of type 1 immunity, cause a lot of collateral damage. They, uh, by releasing reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, your own, your own tissues get damaged. But that's a cost we have to be able to accept in order to, be, uh, control, uh, to, in order to control these p pathogens that have the potential to take over our bodies. Helminth parasites generally do not divide in our systems, um, but they come in one at a time and they grow and they become big animals in our body and they do a little physical damage along the way. So the second sort of challenge that our bodies face is just simply physical injury. And we have processes to deal with that. And in some cases, I mean, you know, take a salamander, you cut it, a limb off and it just grows back, you get regeneration. And there are many aspects of type 2 immunity that I think are involved in regeneration. Um, but a lot of it is just about physically repairing that damage. And that's as much part of dealing with these large migrating parasites um, as actually keeping their numbers down. Um, and so I think the way I see it in the context of evolution, when we were faced with these large animals coming through our systems, this kind of response would probably work. You'd damage the worm, but the collateral damage would be way too great. And in fact, you really want to avoid that kind of reaction to something that is very large inside your tissues. And so um, this sort of anti-inflammatory component makes sense. But what made even more sense was when I started reading the wound healing literature and began to appreciate 
that in order to get good tissue repair, you need to shut off uh, classical inflammation. So this association with, uh, with anti-inflammation and type 2 immunity began to make some sense. And it also began to help me understand why type 1 and type 2 immunity is counter-regulatory. Counter why can't you just mount both a type 1 and a type 2 immune response in the same tissue at the same time? And, and maybe it has to do with the fact that they are fundamentally different processes in which really one cannot proceed while the other is there. And as I, we've begun, and this is just summarizing a lot of work, that a lot of it's unpublished that I don't have time to talk about today, but I've begun to really become fascinated uh, by the fact that a lot of these molecules that are being discovered as being involved in wound repair or anti-inflammation are also involved in wound ki worm killing. Sometimes they're discovered in worm killing first. So for example, these molecules that are the th what I call the big three, and that's not TB, HIV, and malaria, it's my big three, um, YM1, realm alpha, and arginase, um, uh, the, the, all of them are involved in parasite killing. Some of that I say is not, uh, not published. A lot of aspects um, of parasite killing are things that you would also associate uh, with, with tissue repair, like mucus production and matrix deposition. And this is just a very small list. There are many more molecules that fall into this category where they're involved in parasite killing, but they're also turning out to be involved in wound repair. So exactly the same molecules are, are having these dual functions. And I think figuring out how the same molecules are doing these very different things is going to be uh, going to be very interesting. And I'm just putting this in ecological terms of, of resistance and tolerance. In type 1 immunity, uh, resistance and tolerance are considered to be sort of opposing effects. I think in type 2 immunity, resistance and tolerance may actually be essentially the same process. And arginase is of the three the best because arginase is also potently anti-inflammatory. Because it depletes arginine from the media, it actually prevents uh, T cell activation and a lot of other processes that are very inflammatory, and it shuts off nitric oxide production. So, you know, I could end there. This is my pretty model of how the immune system works, and uh, it's hard to prove me wrong because it's evolutionary theory. Um, but um, one of the one of the the sort of slight problems with this model is that it's called anti-inflammatory, and people would always sort of catch me on this about calling it anti-inflammatory, because. How can an inflammatory cell be anti-inflammatory? So the macrophages that we see in helminth uh, infection, they're there in very, very large numbers. They, you have an infection, the parasite comes in, and you get a huge influx of macrophage uh, and it's eosinophils. This is a microfilaria, um, the filarial nematode models we work with, and this is the baby just to give you an appreciation of size. This is the baby. Um, a, a mama's making a few thousand of these, and she would happily fill the room if she was here. Um, it, and so we get this big increase in cell numbers. And so by any definition, that's an inflammatory response. And yet, uh, these are described as being anti-inflammatory, and how can that be? And I, and I think that we came to, we were able to figure out the answer to that. Um, uh, almost, well, definitely inadvertently. We were looking for something else entirely. Um, so we have a, a model in the lab for filarial infection, filarial nematodes causing things like uh, elephantiasis and river blindness. And actually, um, uh, Cecile, who's going to talk next, is going to talk about uh, why I asked if I could go first, so because I can explain this model. So. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it has kinetically very, temporally very similar to the human disease, but it, there's no pathology, which makes it difficult. But we can really use it to begin to understand the immune response to filarial nematodes. The vector's a mite. The parasite is injected uh, subcutaneously um, and migrates through the lymphatics to, uh, to the pleural spaces. And in the pleural spaces, it matures, it grows, goes, undergoes um, molt, and, and um, then reaches sexual maturity um, and produces microfilaria that circulate in the blood stream, and that's, that's in a Balbsy mouse. And this is a picture taken um, from Melody Swartz's lab in Lausanne that just illustrates this. So this is two infective larvae in a lymphatic vessel um, en route uh, to the pleural cavity. Um, and, I, and I make this, uh, also show this slide for a second reason, that in this model we're dealing with a natural route of infection, so we're, we're not actually doing any physical injury like injecting a needle at the site of infection. Importantly, C57 black six mice are resistant to infection. 
So um, resistant in the sense that infection can establish and the parasites mature to a certain point, but they never reach sexual maturity. Um, and after about 20 or 30 days, uh, the parasites begin to die, slowly begin to die. Uh, and there's very large numbers of macrophages and alternatively activated macrophages um, at the site of infection. And so we were really interested in the role um, and in what role macrophages may play in, in the killing of this worm. And I, very importantly, as with most uh, helminth infections, uh, you, Th2 responses are really important in killing the worm. If you knock out Th2 immunity, actually on the C57 black 6 background, if you knock out IL-4, the animal becomes completely susceptible. So it's an entirely, the, the, the control of the parasite is dependent on Th2 immunity. And so we were just looking at the process here just to give you a perspective on the model. Uh, the parasite um, enters, this is just worm number in the plural spaces. The uh, parasites enter about day four. They're all there by day six. But what we saw was that the eosinophil numbers and the macrophage numbers um, total pleural cavity cell numbers came much later, so that the significant increase in macrophages didn't occur until 10 days post-infection. So the parasite's been there almost six days before you really begin to see a significant increase in the number of the cellular infiltrate there. <clears throat> and so we were asking the question is, are the alternatively activated macrophages that are coming in, are they what's, what's killing the worm? Remember that the worm's not dying, uh, beginning to really die till about 20 days post-infection. So what Steve Jenkins in the lab did was that he um, decided to get rid of the macrophages uh, during this stage when the parasites are entering and at the stage when the, when the macrophage numbers are sort of on their logarithmic increase. And we had a bit of a problem with the home office. Well, my fault entirely. Um, I never thought when writing my license to put that we needed to inject interpleurally. Um, and so they said we couldn't do the experiment until I modified the license. So meanwhile, we had to think about what else to do. And we thought, well, no problem. We all know how inflammation works. You have monocytes circulating in the blood and they enter the tissues. So all that Steve really needed to do was deplete the blood monocytes. There, then there'd be no macrophages to enter the tissues and we would be able to tell whether, there was, whether the macrophages were killing the worm. So Steve did this experiment again and again and again and kept depleting the monocytes and he had, I mean, basically the spleen of the animal was gone. There was no monocytes, I promise you, no monocytes, all gone. It made no difference. We had absolutely no effect on the macrophages at the site of infection. Um, and so this really threw us, and so just to give you some hardcore facts data, although it's not really that hardcore, um, it, what, what we then did is we had permission to inject into the pleural cavity, and so we looked at what was happening during a classical inflammatory response as compared to this worm infection. And we could see that um, in a classical inflammatory response, you have a resident population of, of macrophages in the, in the pleural cavity, um, and then in come uh, the, neutroph the neutrophils and the monocytes, and then by three days, the neutrophils have gone and the monocytes have converted into um, an a F480 low macrophage population. When we looked in our, our worm infection model, there was no, that wasn't happening. We had an equivalent number of macrophages appearing by day 10 or 15 post-infection, but the phenotype was exactly the same as a naive animal, F480 high no change in, in the macrophage phenotype. So that suggested to us that the macrophages were proliferating locally at site. And that was a pretty big deal because people think that macrophages don't proliferate and in fact, I had an honor student working in the lab at the time who, who emailed a previous supervisor to say, well, how quickly do macrophages turn over? And he emailed back, macrophages do not proliferate, exclamation point. Um, and we could just laugh because by then the paper had been accepted. But um, so, but what what Steve did is he did um, many different routes. But this is just injecting BRDU three hours before killing the animal. So all the cells uh, that are dividing incorporate BRDU. So you you capture the cells that are in S phase, and you can see when you inject an inflammatory stimulus, they are not dividing. Although the steady state uh, there is steady state proliferation going on in the naive cells. But in our, in, in our infection model, there was really an enormous amount of macrophage proliferation going on. <clears throat> 
And one of the things that we had noted for years was that in an IL-4 deficient animal, we always had fewer macrophages there. And I'd always thought that was a recruitment defect. But now it suggested, and actually it was a proliferation defect. And indeed, that's the case. Here's the proliferation in a wild-type animal and the proliferation in an IL-4 deficient animal. So the lack of macrophages in IL-4 deficient animals was essentially a lack of proliferation. What was more remarkable was that we then decided, well, to see whether IL-4 alone could drive proliferation. So Steve injected IL-4 uh, uh, directly into the animal in a complex form that allows its slow release. And what we were able to see was when we injected that into the peritoneal cavity, we got a huge expansion of macrophages. And um, this was what was even more remarkable is this was throughout the body. So in this case, he's injecting into the peritoneal cavity. But we looked in the liver, the spleen, the lung, the brain, Everywhere in the body, the macrophages were proliferating. And indeed, we haven't done this, um, but other labs have. If you inject IL-4 repeatedly, the animal will die of macrophage hyperplasia. So IL-4 alone just drives a huge amount of macrophage proliferation. Um, we then needed to prove to people that these were actually the resident cells uh, expanding and not uh, some small population from the blood coming in. And if you are fully irradiate an animal, you destroy that resident cell population and it gets replaced from the bone marrow. So we couldn't do a standard bone marrow chimera. So what Steve did was a shielded bone marrow chimera in which the peritoneal and pleural cavity of the mouse is protected by a light shield and only the legs are exposed to radiation, sort of opening up uh, that space. And then transferred in cells, uh, it transferred in bone marrow into those animals. And what you get is a bone marrow chimerism of 70% recipient and 30% donor. Um, and what he then did is the IL-4 complex model as well as the litmusoides infection model, the result is, is the same. If you look in the blood, it's got the same chimerism as the bone marrow, it's 70%, uh, 30%. If you inject with thioglycolate, you get the same chimerism because it's coming in from the blood, so you get 70-30. Uh, when you look at an animal that's in the pleural cavity that's just been in, or peritoneal cavity that's just been injected with PBS, you only get 3% do, um, donor, and that doesn't change even when you're radically expanding. So this is IL-4 complex or a classical stimulus, you get the same number of macrophages. But with a classical stimulus, it's the blood chimerism. With IL-4 complex injection or limusoides infection, it's the same chimerism uh, as, the, as the resident cells. So it was essentially formal proof that it was the resident cells expanding and not within the eight-week time period of this experiment, uh, recruitment from the blood. And we were extremely excited about what we'd done, um, but what we didn't realize is that behind the scenes there was a whole paradigm shift going on in biology, and now we realize one of the reasons the work got accepted so quickly, so high profile, was it was on the back of other work that was about to be published and this is work from people like um, uh, Frederick Geisman and Miriam Murad. And what they have shown is that, that in many tissues, certainly the pleural and peritoneal cavity, in many tissues, uh, the m resident cells are not derived from the bone marrow at all, ever. They're established pre-birth. Um, uh, they're established uh, during embryonic development, and they stay there through self-renewal throughout the life of the animal. And this is true uh, in, in the brain, Langerhan cells, the pleural cavity, many, uh, many, many tissues now, with very specific exceptions, which are uh, skin dermal macrophages and, and the gut. And so the old model in which you had a bone marrow-derived cell circulated in the blood and then went into the tissues to become a recruited uh, a resident cell is no longer there. Instead, it's established pre-birth and it stays, uh, at least in a mouse, we have yet to prove this in humans, although I think pretty fundamentally it's probably the same to some degree, um, you have this resident population self-renewing. So what we needed to know was whether what we were looking at was just basically an expansion of this self-renewal process. And what Steve had done was to, um, to show that uh, using well, a bunch of different models, I won't go into the details now in the interest of time, but it, basically it didn't matter whether it was a resident cell population or a recruited population. If you have IL-4 around, it will convert those cells to becoming um, uh, alternatively activated and make them divide. And I think we were just exceptionally fortunate uh, in that we used a model that had essentially no real inflammatory process and were able then in the 
case of litmusoides, to identify a process that was entirely essentially non-inflammatory. Um, whereas most infection models, uh, even helminth infection models, I think there's a strong inflammatory component, and this is the more likely scenario where you bring in monocytes and then they get converted into alternatively activated macrophages. And we know this is the case for egg deposition in schistosomiasis um, and, and, and certainly in the intestinal tract. Um, and we know that local self-renewal in the cavities is, is driven by uh, CSF1, um, so we assume that maybe IL-4 was acting via CFS, CSF1, but in fact that's not the case, uh, and I'm not showing you the data, but IL-4 is acting completely independently of CSF1, and in fact IL-4 uh, a, relieves the cells from the need for CSF1 and drives them into a much greater level um, of proliferation. Um, and just, uh, um, just a couple more slides. Um, we then did a bunch of, uh, well, we've done a whole bunch of different kinds of transcriptomic analysis, but this is work that, that Graham Thomas did in the lab doing RNA-seq analysis comparing macrophages from wild type and IL-4 receptor deficient animals. And what we can see in this, the, this first one was known that, that basically IL-4 drives a shutdown of all the pro-inflammatory chemokines, really supporting this idea that IL-4 is anti-inflammatory. IL-4 receptor dependent um, expression um, uh, of inhibitory FC gamma receptors, so it drives inhibitory FC gamma receptors and shuts off all the activating receptors. Uh, it uh, turns on molecules that are involved in eosinophil recruitment. Um, and so we think, and there's other labs have now shown this, that macrophages are involved in recruiting eosinophils, uh, this other cell that they need for whatever processes. And what was new, really new and fascinating to us is that all the chemokine receptor expression was shut down. So it didn't look like these macrophages were going anywhere. And there's more and more data to suggest that monocyte-derived macrophages, when they come in, are the ones that traffic to the lymph nodes and do regulatory work. So we think these macrophages are really local macrophages that are here to do the local work. And so this is um, really the answer to how uh, an inflammatory cell can be anti-inflammatory. Um, we think they're stationary and non-migratory. We don't think they're cells that are moving around. We think they're there to do the local business. I have to say that's purely based on the transcriptional analysis, and we yet, have yet to prove that. They expand in numbers by proliferation and, and thereby avoid classical, uh, you know, basically neutrophils uh, and monocytes are pretty, pretty aggressive damaging cells and it's avoiding that kind of recruitment if possible. Um, but there, it, there are functions they need to perform, worm killing, wound repair, whatever they may be, so they can expand locally through proliferation, they can become alternatively activated, and they can perform those functions uh, without bringing in the more dangerous uh, inflammatory pathways. And we, we know they recruit eosinophils, so they presumably need them for some of those functions. Um, and when, when some of the interesting things, one of the most abundant molecules made in specifically in response to IL-4 are complement components. And typically complement would come in with plasma in, in, a, in an inflammatory response. And this is once again just hypothetical from the data, but maybe the complement is produced locally because they're not getting the influx of fluid that you would get in, in, a, in a classical inflammatory response. And I'm going to, um, I had a little bit more data, but I'm going to skip it because it's the end, and I will just summarize. Um, so type 2 immunity is needed for parasite control and efficient uh, and rapid wound repair. Lots more work to really develop all of that. Um, importantly, I think type 2 immunity is fundamentally non-inflammatory, uh, promoting local proliferation over inflammatory cell recruitment. IL-4 can convert recruited inflammatory cells into an alternatively activated phenotype. I say can because um, we have, I have a whole other talk on co-infection where, in fact, if you have a strong inflammatory response, it will completely dominate. So if you have a microbial infection, it'll completely dominate this type, one, type 2 response. Um, and what I didn't show you, that last little bit, and extremely important, we're now, uh, we have a recent publication in collaboration with, um, with Pong Lok in New York that whether a cell comes from the monocyte or whether it comes from the resident ma macrophages makes a big difference in its function. They're transcriptionally very different except for, for the big three, um, which is, are the same. So I will stop there. Um, uh, a lot of the work I talked about today was done by Steve Jenkins, um, but, um, and he's, he gets, he's moved over into this right-hand column because he's left the lab. Um, 
that out now is uh, here in Edinburgh with his own position. A lot of support from great collaborators, but also other people in my lab uh, contributed a lot to this work. Uh, Dominic Lucy, Graham, who has left, was a PhD student who did the transcriptomic work. Uh, Allison runs the life cycle. We couldn't do stuff without her. Uh, and uh, anyway, all those people, and I talked about Pong and Mahesh, which is the one who actually did that work. Thanks very much.